Okay, thanks for clicking there. Uh, I am Mike Hartman, and we are having a conversation today with Christos Makridis, uh, who wrote an article that caught our attention recently about arts philanthropy in the City Journal, uh, published by the Manhattan Institute, of which Christos uh, is an adjunct fellow. Uh, he has several academic affiliations, which you can read about and probably already have in the post uh, of which this video is a part. And he is the co-founder and chief technology officer of Living Opera, uh, about which he'll tell us. It's a, it's a web startup working to bring blockchain technology uh, to the arts, to classical music uh, in that case in particular. Uh, so why don't we assume, by the way, now, Christos, that I am as dumb as I am on these matters. Uh, and, and we'll lower your expectations as well as any viewers. What is, <laughs> blockchain what is blockchain technology? Yeah, well, first off, thank you, Mike. It's awesome to get to know you. And I can't wait for the many more conversations that we're going to have in the months and years ahead. Uh, so blockchain technology is just another distributed and digital way to record activity. And so I think it makes sense just to start with like a, a computer. Computer obviously records digital activity, but it's centralized. You are the custodian of what gets recorded on all your folders, on Word documents, on email, and so on. But on the blockchain, it's a distributed ledger. And so that means that there's many different parties that are partaking in what's called the validation <laughs> gets codified and recorded on that blockchain. There's many different types of blockchains and each one kind of varies based off of what's called the consensus mechanism. It's about how do we agree on what defines activity on the blockchain. And some processes are a little bit more uh, computational intensive than others. And they all the different blockchains try to differentiate themselves with respect to their consensus mechanism. But at its core, it's just a way of recording and authenticating activity. So what then is a decentralized autonomous organization? Are all blockchain things DAOs, as it were, or are DAOs part of, of the larger blockchain category? Yeah, not necessarily. I think of um, Web3 as the broad umbrella for defining all this move towards decentralization. And I put it into personally three different buckets. Fungible tokens like Bitcoin or Ethereum, non-fungible tokens like our Magic Mozart collection, and then DAOs, which have overlap with the other two because you can sometimes gift somebody something with a, a fungible token. Like if you're trying to give somebody a gift, maybe you give them a gift of an NFT or a fungible token. But governance, um, decentralized governance, uh, or these organizations, these DAOs, these de de central, uh, de sorry, de de decentralized autonomous organizations are ways of governing and coordinating activity, usually among geographically disparate individuals. But they're all connected by a common objective. Objective. They're just rallying together. And what's beautiful about them is that they automate, they, at least in theory, they try to automate away a lot of the things that are usually more time intensive, human intensive, that don't need to take the time and an attention of, of an individual. So it allows people to kind of specialize in the areas that they're actually best utilized and most creative. And then it automates away the tasks that can be left to a smart contract, which a smart contract is just an if then statement. If you send me this and I'm going to send you this, if um, these criteria are met, then this is going to happen. So it's just a way of doing things a little bit more at scale and, and through more automation. So let's use Living Opera then as an example to further, I guess, to me, to find. Yeah. I want to I want to join the DAO of Living Opera, if that's how I would even put that. Yep. Become a member, is that what you said? Yeah. Yep. Uh, is it a nonprofit? Yes. Yeah, so we're launching. So Living Opera as an organization, we are um, a Web3 multimedia company. We believe that classical music is beautiful and that it can reach a wider audience. And so we're producing multimedia. But then with the Magic Mozart collection, what we've realized. So my, my best friend, Sula Parasitis and Norman Reinhardt are two world class opera singers. They have been spending their careers, their lives in um, this area of classical music. And they've found so many 
singers, whether they're starting out or even whether they're mid-career or late in their career, that there's oftentimes a big knowledge gap around the entrepreneurial skills that are necessary to actually thrive in the marketplace. And sometimes they're basic things around financial literacy, around managing an agent, around social media, and uh, even like one of the top agencies in opera only got like an Instagram and social media channel about 10 months ago. So the reality is, is that there has been a lot of um, sluggishness with the adoption of technology within classical music. So I'm leading up to the, the Living Arts DAO. So Living Opera, we believe classical music is beautiful. We want to get it out. We're producing multimedia, but we've got this desire to educate uh, artists, but then we also want to try to provide income generating opportunities to artists. And so that's what led us towards Magic Mozart, where it's a generative art collection around the magic flute. And that's the educational component. We want people talking about the magic flute. We want people talking about classical music. And so each NFT brings a piece from the magic flute, which was Mozart's final opera. And then it also has a personalized musical composition where depending on the NFT you get, you also get a musical composition based on this dice game that he invented in 1787, which was like the first uh, generative art kind of that became widely known and adopted. So we're the first to produce it on a smart contract. Now, the Living Arts DAO is kind of the back end to all of this. The other stuff is the front end, the artistic side, the kind of cool crypto side. The, the Living Arts DAO is our, we're forming a nonprofit and the aim is to create a micro grant community where an artist maybe needs $500, $1,000, They can make a proposal after they've gone through our arts entrepreneurship curricula. So we realize we don't just want to put a bunch of money out there and let people kind of run wild. We want to educate people around the curricula that we have created because of Sula and Norman's careers and having struggled with a lot of the things that I mean, people struggle with, but then they don't talk about it, they don't solve. So we have that curricula. And then after you go through it, you get a digital credential and you become eligible to create a proposal on the DAO. And then NFT holders, the people that are micro philanthropists with the Magic Modes or NFT, now have skin in the game where they get to influence the composition of projects that take shape in the Living Arts DAO. And so at the core, think of traditional nonprofit, but now it's about more funding the artists. And it's also about creating a feedback loop where the artist and the philanthropist kind of get to journey together and you have more say over what happens versus you just put money into a symphony and then you assume that it's going to be used really well. And we definitely support people people that want to support their local symphony. That's important. That's good. But this provides another outlet, particularly for those individuals that feel like the arts and cultural sectors haven't really been living up to their full potential. So how do I get this NFT if I want to? I'm in, let's say, and yeah. I'll be a member. I want to yeah. join. I want to help. I'm an opera fan. I yeah. want to offer support in this way through the DAO. How do I get an NFT? Do I go to a website with my credit yeah, card? Yeah, our, our website is mozart.livingopera.org. And our main Living Opera website is just livingopera.org. So we we very much, I mean, anyone should read our white paper, learn about our vision, what we're trying to do. And there's multiple pathways to engage. One of what, the most obvious is just by buying an NFT, of course, and that, that shows into this community. And I buy an NFT with a credit card or cash. I, I mean, in other words, how yeah, do I so, get my deduction? I want my deduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now you have to have a digital wallet like a MetaMask in the next week. And probably by the time that many people are listening to this, uh, you'll will have the functionality to actually buy with your credit card. We're also um, about to uh, submit all the paperwork to get the nonprofit status. And we'll get a provisional nonprofit status that allows you to, um, to, to, to kind of show that the living art Arts DAO is going to be a, um, a nonprofit. So we're still in the process of working with our legal counsel and getting all the paperwork there, but it's within the trajectory. And, and there is, I mean, I can take my deduction. I thought maybe there'd be some reason that that'd be a problem or there'd be some speed bumps, but nonprofit DAOs will, contributions to them will be deductible. Even though yes, you have yes. and that, that's something that's unique to what we're trying to do because there's a lot of anon, uh, anonymity within the crypto space. We're not trying to like, hi, we are Sula Parasitis, Norman Reinhardt, and Christos McCready's. We've got public uh, personas out there. They they continue to perform. Uh, I'm literally just in Houston right now. Norm is going to be doing his performance at Houston Grand Opera and performing in Valencia, Sula in Athens in another couple of months. So we're we're not trying to hide. We are trying to be as transparent, accountable, and visible as we can. 
And I can see why it's decentralized because the members, according to the terms of the smart contract, as you call it, get to participate. Yeah. Uh, and that can probably be written in almost any way. Like my voting, I'm now going to call them shares. I don't know if I'm imposing on you a lexicon that's not appropriate or, you know, no, one that a you, lot of, uh, yeah. Do yeah, I true. get more power if I give more money? If you have more NFTs, each NFT comes with um, a voting capability. Something that we're thinking about is how do we ensure that this is not completely centralized? So we wouldn't want to have one person holding like 90% of the portfolio, but yeah. that's not really a risk that we're, 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 we're kind of encountering right now. Or if somebody buys like more than like, I don't know, let's say 200 NFTs or something like that, then we'll, we'll like talk to them or something like that and make sure there's no shady business going on. But that's not really a risk. And then the other thing, I just this would add is that there's other benefits that NFT holders also get. So for example, individuals that hold an NFT will be entered in to get an all expenses paid trip to see Sula uh, perform in Athens in March of 2023, Norman to perform in, um, in Valencia, and you'll be able to bring somebody alongside with you. So there's other perks that we're trying to get in addition to the obvious being able to vote and um, the tax exempt status in, in uh, Living Arts DAO. How is this a form of crowdfunding or different from it? Yeah, it's a great question because that is a, a really close analogy. We're trying to deliver more value to the end user than traditional crowdfunding. Uh, I think uh, a Patreon and some of those other platforms that are out there are good in trying to open up the floodgates of capital, but they don't provide direct ways to engage with the underlying artist. It's more like you might hear about, oh, this is how it went. So for us, we're trying to create an incentive compatible journey between the artist and the philanthropist. And one, you... Uh, actually get to vote. So there's opportunities to influence the trajectory of the DAO. Two, you get perks from the living, from the living opera community like Sula and Norman performing. Three, there's also a decentralized platform that we're creating where people can converse and go back and forth and it becomes a community of practice versus something that's more one-sided. Like on Patreon, you might be able to share updates. So we're trying to take that model, but then add a lot more to it and make it all decentralized and people owning their own data. So we're probably going to be working with a company called Bunches that will give individuals sovereign digital identities. And so unlike on Facebook or other Web2 platforms where your data is being harvested and being sold out, your data is yours and you can decide whether to sell that and get remunerated for it so that's another kind of feature of this is yeah. that we're trying to build on this fundamentally new infrastructure on the blockchain yeah if i'm outvoted all the time and my recommendations or whatever don't pass muster i can leave i suppose yeah, yeah you, you and i get leave, compensated yeah, yeah. That's that's also another uh, important element within NFT markets is the liquidity of the NFT, being able to resell that back to another buyer. So because of what we're doing in Living Opera, we believe that this this token is, is going to appreciate just like a house would appreciate. We're not obviously making any promises of what it might be or how much money somebody can make because we're really trying to pioneer in the philanthropy space. But um, yeah, you, you could sell that back. And there might be different seasons that people are in. Maybe some Somebody is a young professional, they believe in the arts, they want to take this out, but then they get married, they have kids, or re they realize that maybe they want to engage in a different way and they want to sell that NFT back. That's totally doable and um, and very much could be accommodated. It seems as if the thinking might be a little bit ahead of the law. Uh, who Who's going to, who regulates this, if anybody, I assume I've already said yeah. that, I think the answer is no. Who's going to regulate this? I mean, there, there uh, yeah, several questions might arise, uh, and probably will. Who's going to regulate yeah. them? Where might they well, start? Well, the short answer is that part of the reason that we all relocated to uh, Tennessee and specifically to Nashville is because in April of 2022. Uh, thanks to leadership by uh, Senator Jason, or, uh, Congressman J Jason Powell, he uh, pioneered this legislation that allows DAOs to be treated as LLCs or nonprofits. And so it creates a new liability shield around it. Now, that is a state legislation versus some of the federal legislation that's being deliberated upon. And you kind of have CFTC, SEC. Uh, and FinCEN all trying to regulate the space and sort of fighting some of their own turf wars. So in theory, this this is being um, 
influenced by SEC, but we're trying to be super transparent about the philanthropic aims here. Uh, we are providing utility. It's not a security. It's not something where we're, we're in, you know, the Howey test and people might have heard that there's a couple of different conditions. So we think that SEC is probably trying to get into this space, but NFTs are very distinct from an Ethereum or a Bitcoin and some of those other fungible tokens that are out there. Well, why don't we finish up with part one there and then come back uh, with a part two that will address what this might mean for philanthropy. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Mike.